Uh, good morning, ladies. Uh, this is again the English uh, poetry course from the Islamic University of Gaza, Palestine. Uh, today we'll have uh, one session on neoclassical poetry, but before, before we do that, uh, let's hear some of the poems or parodies some of you wrote and want to uh, share with us. Uh, could you come, please? Good morning, everyone. I wrote a parody of Come Live With Me and Be My Love. Uh, in this parody, the, the voice is an Israeli voice. When, the, Isra when uh, the Israelis were calling people to come and immigrate to Palestine. So this is wh uh, what I wrote. <coughs> come live with me and have, come live with us and have your land. And we will all our wishes stand. That fertile lands, trees and fields, milk or flowing honey yields. And we will sit upon the mosques, seeing the Arabs apply their jokes. By Belfort promise to whose signed, singing Hetigva we first find. And we will make the homes and beds, and a thousand jobs do trade with Arabs, their homes get in, their olive trees and holy lands, then when? All Israeli soldiers shall dance and sing, for Arabs defeat each fifth John morning. Yet, if Muslims unite and gather again, then go back or, or you'll taste bane again. Okay. That's a very nice uh, attempt at, again, appropriating a uh, particular text to your own cause. Thank you, Reem. Rowan? It's a short poem. Life is too short to hesitate, taking the adventures our hearts indicate. Life is too short to keep thinking logically. Set your soul free and let madness spread excessively. Let it happen, darlings. Don't think about the surroundings. Smell, touch, and feel it. The freedom you wished you could even have a bit. Farewell overthinking. Goodbye regretting. Hey, love. Hello, hope. Welcome, happiness. Get out of here, sadness. No fears, no tears. Just the smiles all over here and there. Open the curtains and stir. God, colors here and there. The sun is smiling. Blue clouds are surrounding. Ha, everything sucks. How I dare. It's nice, pretty, and so rare. The trip we decide to take with those who are willing to stay. With them, all scars disappear. All hunting ghosts fear. As long as they are here, we stay by fear. Poetry? Or poetry notes or poems? Both. Both. Okay, good. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have a birdie about uh, a birdie of uh, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. My mama's eyes. My mama's eyes are nothing like the sun. They give him color and give him fun. If sun has wires, golden wires grow on her smile. Sun rays are tranquil, warm for the sight. But no such warmth feel I, as her own teeth are burning bright. For I am shake, disturbed with this delight. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare. And yet by, by heaven I feel this love as rare, as when we meet and she prevails, no such fear and no despair. Therefore by heaven you see I dare say that her love has no compare. Okay, so I've written a parody about uh, also my mistress' eyes, but here I want to show you something. Now, when I read the poem, I, I was actually thinking about this person here. If we, if we, if we look at uh, the description that Shakespeare himself gave, it was like describing dimmed eyes and no red lips, tanned complexion, and black curly hair, no redness in her cheeks, sm uh, she smells normal. Uh, music is better than her voice, and she walks. She ain't an angel. So if we think about it, this probably represents most, if not all of us. So here I, I'm trying to draw the same portrait of this lady here, but in a different style. Uh, okay. Okay. I will read it now. The beauty I behold is nothing mundane. Your eyes charm me with endless depth of ink, shielded with black peacock's feather in vain. Your lips keep it bow, conquered every pink and lived peacefully on your sun-kissed skin. Hair drowns me in endless stretch of midnight sky. It waves, I wave, or I commit a sin. With few words, you shout a million replies. One smile, two dimples, are all it shall take 
to drill your love in my heart as dauntless. Your natural scent travels at daybreak. No perfume could ever do you justice. By heavens, my love for you is rare. When with other lovers, me you shall compare. I just want to say one thing. I chose to confront her because Yerehov, I don't. I think that uh, he meant to uh, highlight her imperfections. So yes, this is kind of like challenging for Shakespeare. Okay, thank you very much. Very good, very good poems. I know many of you have hidden talents. It comes to writing uh, fiction and uh, poetry, but you need some some pushing. I'm willing to do the pushing. The, the guiding, the, the help, just keep writing. Okay, so today we move to English poetry, neoclassical and, or Augustan poetry. We already mentioned something about neoclassicism. We mentioned something about them when we discussed John Donne. Remember, many people consider the metaphysicals, John Donne and his followers, to be a digression. Our argument here is no, John Donne was as important, John Donne and his followers, are where and are still as important as any movement, maybe as important as the romantic movement of, of poetry, not a digression, not somebody or a group of, of poets who were doing they don't know what. And we understood this. Uh, so he, John Donne was in the heyday of neoclassicism, as I claim. So therefore, we need to go back to two of the most significant names of uh, neoclassical poetry. Number one is uh, John Milton. We're going to study a, sh a short extract from his uh, epic, uh, Paradise Lost. And then we're going to study in more detail an extract from Alexander Pope's uh, essay on, uh, on criticism. Just to get an idea what uh, neoclassical or Augustan poetry is. So this is by John Milton, an extract from Paradise Lost. <clears throat> and as the name suggests, it's about paradise. Paradise we lost. Who are we? How did we lose this paradise? What is this paradise? What happened? How can we probably regain it later on? When you look at the title here, you come with the fact that this is basically not an ordinary poem, especially if you take paradise, like literally not. Sometimes when you lose something, you say, oh, my, par my paradise. Many people speak of Palestine as paradise lost, for example, or you losing something. But here, this is literally about paradise. This is not a metaphor or some kind of uh, simile or something. When we read the poem, again, it begins with of man's, there should be an apostrophe here, of man's first disobedience and the fruit. Of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woo. With loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. If you look here, there are many biblical references, many biblical references taken directly from religious texts, from the Bible itself. Look at the subject matter of the poem. It's not an ordinary subject matter. It's not, uh, in, in their opinion, uh, simplistic that like we have with the, with the metaphysicals. Remember, we said the subject matter for the, most of those neoclassicists had to be about significant issues, issues of great significance to the society, the collective society as a whole, not to individuals. We'll see how also the Romantics hated this about this, uh, the poetry of this age. They said, no, poetry has to be self-expression rather than uh, a tool of teaching and educating or sometimes delighting. If you notice here, of man, this is a, a phrase, of man's first disobedience and of the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought, this is still a dependent clause, brought death into the world, brought death and woo into the world with loss of Eden, you know, Eden. And that's the title here, Paradise Lost, Loss of Eden. Till one greater man, perhaps he's talking here about Jesus, 
restore us. He did write actually another text which he called Paradise Regained, where again Jesus brings us back to God, saves us, the Savior. Restore us and regain the blissful seat, our place in, in heaven. Sing. This is the main verb. Delayed for like in, the, in line six. Interesting. Sing, O oh, muse. Sing, muse. The muse is considered to be the source of inspiration for many classical uh, poets, almost all of them. The muse, you know, in... in, in, in in Arabic, we say Rabbit al Shar sometimes, or Shaytan al Shar. The Arabs used to believe in this. Some poets believe that every poet has this, is like this muse thing. The muse here means a goddess of poetry. I think I quoted Ahmad uh, Matar the other day saying something to the effect of uh, uh, something like this. So the inspiration, like doesn't have to, start to be strict, restricted by rules. But look at how this muse, the source of inspiration for poetry, is not ordinary, it's also heavenly. Heavenly. Sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of Oreb or Sinai didst inspire that shepherd, and perhaps the shepherd is Moses, who first taught the chosen seed, probably the Israelites. And now look at this. Of man's first disobedience, that's Adam, Adam and Eve, right? There's the forbidden tree here, the tree of knowledge, the fruit. And there's the uh, garden of Eden, Jannat Adam. Look at the characters, look at the setting. A very significant representation of what neoclassical poetry uh, was mainly about. You don't talk about ordinary people, about poor people, about the masses. You speak about significant issues. This is, if, if you read this text and you have no idea uh, about the biblical story of Adam and Eve or even the, the story we, we, we tell in, in, in Islam, you will find this difficult to understand. And again, I'm imagining somebody in the 17th century reading this. If this person is not religious, doesn't go regularly to the church to hear very often about Christ and the forbidden tree, there will be a lot of difficulty understanding what this man is talking about. Now look at the, even these references, Orib and, and, and Sinai. So sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of Orib or Sinai did, did inspire the shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, and in the beginning is a direct quote from also the Bible. In the beginning was the word, probably the opening uh, verses of the Bible. How the heavens, if you look here, like the extra, the, the syllable there is gone. Heaven should be read as heavens to keep the music of, or, or the flow and the music of the, the meter the, of the line. How the heavens, look at what he's doing here again. How the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. How God created the heavens and earth. Look at what the poet again is doing. This is not a love poem. This is not a relationship poem. It's a poem about how God created the universe. And if Sion held delight thee more and Siola's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I then invoke thy aid. You know, to invoke, like to try to beg for somebody to, to bring, to be inspired by something. Thy aid, probably he's talking to still the heavenly muse. I invoke. This is, my, this is how I can write poetry, by, by being inspired. Thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount, where it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And I find this really beautiful and sweet. Things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. 
look at the, 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 you know, the ambition here to do so. And indeed, this is something that is unmatched. This is one of the most beautiful poems. It's a very, very long poem, thousands of lines. If you are interested more in, in Milton, one of the most fascinating uh, poets, you could at least listen to his poetry on YouTube. You will find some good dramatization of this poem and sometimes uh, sketches on, on YouTube. You'll, you'll enjoy this. Things, look at what he's doing. He's not doing something in ordinary. He knows this from the beginning. Things unattempted yet. Things that have never been written about. In prose, yet in prose or rhyme. This is an old uh, spelling of rhyme. Okay. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, seeking instruction. For thou knowest thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread dove-like sat, sat brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant, what in me is dark. That's the object, that's the, why he's doing it. He wants what is dark in him to be illumined, to be bright, to be lightened. What is low, raise and support, bring me up, that to the highest, the highest of this great argument. And again, the most important uh, thing is how this opening ends there here. This is just the opening. Why are you writing this? Why do you write poetry? Why is this poem being, being written? Because he wants to assert, I may, in order to, I may assert eternal providence. And eternal providence, that God is there, that God is taking care of everything, is watching over us, that he will always protect us, that whatever God does, it's for our own good. I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. So if you sometimes suffer or you know you are in pain, you lose, you don't get what you like, what you love, what you work for, don't worry because this is uh, God's doing and God likes us all, loves us all. It's always going to be for your own benefit. If you get it, it's good. If you don't get it, it's, it's also good. And I usually say that this is basically not the job of poets. It's, it's the, the job of prophets and messengers. Look at again how the poet here is assuming this position, that being a, being a prophet-like, getting inspiration from whatever it gets, from God, from the muse, the spirit, in order to write great poetry. Poetry that, in the definition of a neoclassicists, neoclassical critics, poetry that teaches and delights. You'll be delighted here, but also it's also going to teach you about about life, about the creation. Now when you read this, you need to be careful because it, this is a religious poem, indeed it is a religious poem, but many people did not take it as a religious poem. Many Christians hated John Milton for doing this and considered him to be, you know, heretic in, in a way, blasphemous. Because in the text, who are the main characters again? That's, there's God, Adam, and Eve, and Satan, you know, the angels, the good and the fallen ones. Now, in the text, because in the literature there is no pure or good or bad. Literature that, and I know many students want to write short stories or texts or whatever, and they usually focus on the, on the pure good or the pure evil. This is not good literature. Literature is about the gray area, the area that makes us all wonder and think. It's not about uh, being too good or too bad. It's about a, a good person doing something bad or a bad person doing something good. Now, in Paradise Lost, Satan sometimes, the devil, is depicted as blameless or as uh, to blame as other characters. And sometimes you feel like, oh, you feel sorry for Satan. If you do, it doesn't mean you're evil. It means uh, John Milton is, is a genius. But that's not what I want, I want uh, uh, to focus on. But it's good to think about, about this. So again, we end here this excerpt by uh, uh, what he, why he's doing this, why he's writing this text. I may assert eternal providence and to justify the ways of God to men. 
I find this very beautiful in many ways, the poetry, the, uh, if you notice, of course, there's no uh, particular regular rhyme scheme there because this could be classified as blank verse. Like in Shakespeare, when you write thousands and thousands of lines, it's going to be very tough to keep the rhyme uh, regular. So you free yourself, this is poetry, but you free yourself of the, uh, the, 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 the rigidity of, of the rhyme scheme. Now most importantly, this is say on criticism by Alexander Pope. Basically lived the first half of the 18th century. Remember Alexander Pope, he was one of the critics who did not like John Donne. And when many critics who even didn't like John Donne said that John Donne at least he was witty, like he has this unmatched intellectuality and wit. Alexander Pope said, nope, he doesn't have even imagination. His imagination is ordinary. And I find him very interesting. He's a, one of the most canonical writers, but also very interesting. If you read him and Shakespeare, I, I, read, I once read an article that uh, explained how Alexander Pope was not happy with many things in Shakespeare's plays, and he would just fix them and change them and edit them, saying that it should be this way, Shakespeare must have meant it this way, not that way. Shakespeare was wrong. That's very extreme in many ways. Okay, so the title is also very interesting. It says, and it says on, on criticism. If one of you wants to read, like, if you Google, okay, you have some time to kill, you Google essay on criticism, you want to know more about criticism and how to do criticism, and this essay pops up as the first result, you're going to be surprised. Because this is not an essay, it's, an, it's, it's a poem. But look at how even essays, even your, your criticism, your critical ideas are written in the form of of, of, of long poems, not ordinary poems. The second thing we notice is this foreign language, not English. Again, imagine yourself living in the 18th century. You, 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 it's Latin, I guess. You don't have, your father couldn't afford the money to send you to university or even to a grammar school, but you worked hard and you managed to be able to read English and you pride yourself in this. And then, Somebody tells you, hey, there's this interesting uh, text if you want to read. And it's like, okay, essay on criticism. And what? Well, that's, that's not an essay, it's a poem. And then you come face to face with, with, a, with a foreign language, a language you're not familiar with. I'm not sure if this is going to be a turn off or what. But again, this is one reason why I say that much of the poetry written by those uh, people was poetry written by the elite and for the, the elite. You had to be educated at university sometimes to understand their allusions. There are many allusions. Like when you read uh, uh, um, John Milton, there are so many religious and, um, allusions and allusions to other places and sometimes mythologies that you don't get if you don't read about them. You have to do Effort. Unlike John Donne, all you have to do sometimes is just to think and try to connect things. So, and also what he says, this is translated here, I think this is a quote from Horace. It's translated into, if you have come to know, it's, it's like a challenge. The poem opens with a challenge. If you write something as good as this, then show it to me. If you don't, then follow me. In a way, you can't do this. Nobody can do something like this. If you have come to know any pres uh, prospect more correct than these, share it with me, brilliant one. If not, use these with me. Follow me. These are the way to write poetry. These are the ways to write poetry. These are the rules and the regulations. And again, this is only the opening uh, bit extracts from essay on criticism. Let's focus more on them, uh, say, discuss issues and examine how he wants us to write poetry. The first uh, idea is, the first, the opening paragraph is an imperative uh, verb. First, follow. Follow what? We need to follow nature. You're already familiar with Plato and Aristotle, imitating nature. Somebody said, was it Plato? Plato said, 
imit poetry is not good because it's just imitation of an imitation, the world of being and the world of becoming. We're not writing anything original. We're just imitating something that is itself an imitation of a perfect thing. And then Aristotle said, it's okay as long as our imitation is good, is, is close to, to, to nature. So, the, the first, but again, don't, don't mix between the concept of nature for the Romantics and the, the concept of nature for, for Alexander Paul. Nature basically means the world that exists around us. And in many ways, nature is perfect. We are, we are perfect. We are created in this fascinating symmetrical image. Look at the eyes and the nose, where everything is, right? Like almost everybody. Look at the animals, uh, the, the tigers and the, the lions or the cats, or like how beautifully they are. They're very symmetrical. Look at the trees. Most of the trees, you'll find them in a way very, very symmetrical. So if you want to produce something, you need to echo the perfection and the symmetry of, 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 of nature around us before it is touched and changed and damaged by man. First, follow nature and your imagination frame by here because nature is, has just standards. Her standard is just is fair. Not sure if it means more than this. And also which is still the same. Nature was and is and will be. It's almost fixed. I think here the idea is that if you count on your imagination and you, on your uh, feelings, emotions, experiences, uh, encounters, these are things that are changeable by time, possibly changeable. You change. Now you're sad, then you're happy, now you're optimistic, and then you're pessimistic. We can't count on this because they're not fixed, they're not the same. But nature is the same, it doesn't change. So it should inspire us to write in, in, in a particular way. And also nature is, I like this word, unerring. You know, to err is human, to forgive is divine. So nature never makes mistakes, never errs. Unerring nature, still divinely bright. One clear, unchanged, and universal light. I think the idea is that nature provides us with clear, unchanged, universal light, life, force, and beauty must all impart. Imparts all of these on us. Nature imparts, gives us, bestows, bestows on us light, life, force, and beauty. We can be touched by by nature because it gives us everything we need, we require. And also, at once, nature should be, that's following nature, at once the, the source and end and taste of art. What a beautiful thing to say. Can someone try to explain this? At once, the source and end and test of art. Talking about nature. But life, our life. How's that? The source of our life. We like born here, and the end of our life in our graves. And the test of art, like, art is art. Art. Here, art. It's like the experience of the whole life. Hmm. More, please. So mm. you do not really see except for this imitation of mm. the imitation. So in a way or another, this this nature is uh, or represents everything in your life. You did not really see anything else to be inspired by or mm. something. More? It's a summary of I don't think he means here uh, nature being our source and our end. He's He's saying that nature is the source of art, the end of art, the test of art. If you want to, because this is about writing poetry, it's his own criticism. You're inspired. You should be. You have to be inspired by nature and natural elements. And we write to reflect on natural elements. The end, not the end like 
finish, done. It's why we do things, you know, the end, we say sometimes the end doesn't justify the means. That's why we write poetry. We write poetry to imitate, to echo, to mirror life, to mirror nature. And at the same time, it's the test of art. And that's a very extreme thing to say. The thing is that this idea about nature being the test of life is very, very, very subjective. Because nature is not a human being to, to test things. But again, those poets with Horus and the rules of decorum, remember I'll go through them when I finish again, so you remember, you don't forget. Uh, those people looked at, they, they believed that the greatest Greek and ancient poets were the closest to nature. Nature that is unchanged before man could change and destroy nature. So when they wrote poetry, their poetry was a perfect reflection of, of nature. Okay, so we study these poems. We study these poems and we come up with the criteria and standards why these texts are great. And then we follow these rules. So in reality, we're not following nature because nature is different. Sometimes you find trees that are not symmetrical. Sometimes you find things that are not, that don't go, that have, don't have balance or, or symmetry or a pattern. We are indeed, we're following people who wrote poetry in a particular way. But those critics claim that those people are the best, the perfect embodiment of nature. So when we say nature is the test of art, it's actually not nature itself, but the rules of decorum devised in a way, not devised by Horace. Horace examined the greatest literary works of the golden age of poetry 2,000 years ago. And then said, okay, these are great because one, subject matter, two, the language, three, the, uh, uh, the form. And if you want to write great poetry, you need to follow these standards. So the test of art, if you want to examine whether a, test, a, a text is great or not, you bring it to these criteria devised by those poets and critics. If, these, if the text is closer to, uh, to these criteria, then like. If it's not, then meh. And that's why John Donne, you know, in many ways violated these rules of decorum, violated the natural standards set by those uh, poets. In form, in theme, in language. We're going to see also next class how the Romantics also violated everything about this. They didn't believe, they trashed everything the neoclassicists came, uh, came up with. Nature is the source of these beautiful things. Thing. So okay. And also they also they, they should embody, embody nature, true. If you write, if you want to, life should embody. I don't know what exactly he means by force, but beauty, if you write beauty, if, if you want, uh, beauty is inspired by nature, but also if you want to write about something that's beautiful, you imitate nature, in a way. What do you think? He's against. No. So how should he be with them, like when he said that about the nature that it is the test of art? So when I want to write about something, the nature will be the source of my poetry or my, my uh, uh, art, while nature have like from black to white, like it, it doesn't like meant to move. I just answered this question in, 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 a, in a way. How, again, this, these rules are inspired by by like Homer, I like, you know the Iliad and the Odyssey and those great literary works of 2,000 years ago. Those literary works are inspired from nature, not the nature is inspired from them. Yeah, true. So they are inspired by nature because they were uh, closer to nature than us, to the perfect uh, reality of nature than us now, today. Okay. So when they wrote poetry, they were very close to nature. And then if you examine these texts, you come up with the, with the rules that we have to follow. The rules dictate that uh, there should be a particular language, a particular form, and a particular subject, subject matter. He is. That's Alexander Pope. 
That's Alexander Pope, please. No, he doesn't say that. Where is he saying, don't depict natural elements? No, not this, but the subject matter of, of the poetry should not be like romantics, for example. Imagination and natural elements. So we, we haven't come to imagination and the romantics yet. Yes, oh. I get this. But the idea, the, the main idea is to uh, be get inspired by the steadiness, the rules Possible, of the possible, yeah. Possible, please. Na actually, not that nature follows rules, that nature it's is the rules. Yeah. Yes, I think that by nature he means what is right and what is wrong, not like nature. Like but I think everything, 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 but even... Human nature, like what does your, your nature... I don't think he basically means human nature, like the human nature, because human nature is erring. Everybody knows this. Oh. I think it means everything, like our nature as humans, but also life around us, the creatures, the creation as a whole, and we being part of this. This is what I, I believe. We can look more into what well, because they, those people would be using words in a way that we don't use them nowadays. Like we'll see wit and judgment, how he tries to do, uh, look at them. Now, uh, more art from that fund, so this, this is a fund, like you take, you take money from, you take inspiration from. Each just supply provides works without show and without pomp presides. I don't know how, like this is like, well, you work without pomp, you know, pompous, pedantic, being, showing off your linguistic and uh, uh, poetic uh, 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 abilities and skills. Although some people accuse those neoclassicists of being, you know, pompous, of trying to show off, to use language in a way, you know, we, we spoke many times about the highly embellished language, the language that nobody understands except educated people, people who went to Oxford or, uh, or Cambridge. In some fa uh, fair body, thus the informing soul with spirits feeds, with vigor fills the whole. Each motion guides, because we are guided by, again, uh, by, by the nature of things, each motion guides and every nerve sustains itself unseen. But in the ethics remain some to whom heaven in wit has been profuse. Uh, look at again heaven. This is just one syllable because he wants to do something change. So I think here he's saying that some heaven, God, nature, life, give some of us an excess of wit, too much wit. You know, sometimes you, somebody cries profusely, like you cry a lot. So some to whom heaven in wit has been profuse. Many people were blessed by excessive wit, excessive intellectuality. Want as much more to turn it to its use, to make use of this wit, probably by writing poetry. For wit, and then he goes to something that I find very striking here. For wit and judgment often are at strife. I find it striking because, you know, when, when two things are at strife, like struggling, like kind of a conflict, conflicting interest here. Does he mean wit, the brain, the mind, possibly, and judgment mean the instinct? instinct, our two intuition, our guts, knowing how you feel about things. I'm not sure, but these things are at strife. I think the wit is the mind, but the judgment is a decision you make by using your wit. Using your? But that's still an intellectual thing, an intellectual activity. But if we talk about the heart here, we talk about feelings, feelings and emotions rather than ideas and, and thoughts. Now what I usually do with, with, with Alexander Pope, I want you to try to do this. I usually try to hide, when I read one line, I try to hide uh, the other line and guess 
what word he's going. I, it's a game I play. It's a very boring game I play sometimes. Uh, try to guess the rhyme scheme, the, the rhyme, how he's going to rhyme the line. And when I, when I got here for wit and judgment, often are at strife, though meant each other's aid like man and wife. I never expected him to go for, for wife. Because, but again, in poetry, anything is possible. It's just, it takes a simile or a figure of speech and everything can be possible. Why do I find this interesting? Uh, we know, like, and we see this all the time. I pronounce you husband, uh, uh, man, and wife, right? But logically speaking, it, should be, it shouldn't be man and wife. It should be man and woman or husband and wife. I know it's more common to say man and wife, but some, some feminists will find this offensive because it suggests that a man, when he marries, never changes. He's the same. A man is a man, no matter what happens to him. But the woman, when she gets married, she changes totally. She becomes somebody else because she is no longer a woman, in a way, she becomes a wife. Probably I'm putting too much into this, or stretching it a little bit. But I find this very striking here. And does he mean, like when he says, wit and judgment, man and wife, does he mean wit like in man and judgment, and judgment like in wife? But also there's something interesting. Though meant each other, he's saying that wit and judgment should complement each other, should complete each other, should be there in harmony. And he uses one of the most striking similes here, like man and wife. And we know men, like husbands and wives are not always, you know, in a harmonious relationship. So this is a very strange also thing to say, like man and wife. So for wit and judgment often are at strife, though they are meant to be, to me meant each other's aid, to aid, to aid each other, to help each other, to complement each other, like man and, and wife. And finally, uh, is this the final thing? No, we still have the finally to come. Uh, Tis more to guide than spare the muses steed. You know steed? What's steed? Steed. What's steed? What's a steed? Don't watch Shrek. Oh, any cartoon. There's always a steed in cartoon movies. Steed is horse. What is the poetic word? Steed. Like in Arabic, like horse is in Arabic. Uh, 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 horse al hisan masana. You don't find the word hisan in, in poetry, right? It's not poetic. Yeah. Or do you find al khayl or it is more to guide. Now going back, again, it's not easy sometimes to follow the pronouns here because here says it is not. Is he referring again to nature, the nature of things? It is more to guide. These rules guide us. The rules of nature, the standard of nature, the just fixed standard of nature is meant to guide us, then spare the muses steed. I find this very, also very strange for, coming from uh, Alexander Pop. Look at uh, John Milton. John Milton was invoking the muse. He was expecting instructions and inspiration from them. He was asking for help to do this great project of his. Now here he says, if you're basically writing poetry means you need to guide your muse, your writing, rather than spare. You know spare here? You know spare? Anybody follows football? Premier League, England. The spare is, what's the spare? What? No. Spare. The spare, when, when usually, when, when horsemen, they, when they ride, first thing they do, they, usually it's not good for uh, horsemen to carry sticks and hit the horse. It's not good for, it's for the, you know, the optics of it. A horse shouldn't be hit, unlike a donkey sometimes or a mule. 
So the first thing they do, they just hit with the uh, uh, back of their uh, foot, they hit the horse. But usually, we see this in Western movies, in Hollywood movies, there's some metal there. The pointy, spiky uh, uh, metal. No, that's for the horse. This is for the horseman. Okay? Yeah, exactly. We see it in, in Hollywood uh, cowboy movies. In Arabic, it's called al mihmaz Mihmaz, because it tihmiz. So there's a football team in England called uh, uh, Tottenham Hotspurs. That's some of the Spurs, Al Mahamis, something like this. Very strange in Arabic, but very beautiful in English. So we're not, he says, we need to guide. Again, he's not also talking about the muse. He brought a horse for the muse. Okay? Th then spare the muse's steed. We should not spare the muse's steed. We should control it and guide it. Restrain his fury. His still refers to the steed. Restrain, limit. Remember we said for John Donne, these rules were limiting, were restraining for imagination and experience and whatever. Even for the Romantics later on, they believed that these rules are not only restrictive, but also repressive. They restrict you from what you want to say, but they also repress you. They keep your feelings like deep inside you, causing, you know, implosion sometimes. Restrain his fury, then provoke his speed. Don't provoke the speed of your muse. Don't let your muse loose, free, unchained, ungoverned, uncontrolled, unpatterned, unorganized. There should be rules, there should be organization. The winged and I found, I, again, I find it very, very strange that he goes back to horse. He just said steed, meaning horse, and then he comes back to horse, which rhymes with, with, with course. The winged courser, curse, courser, like a generous, again, we drop here the gener, generous, the extra uh, horse, so we have a perfect, uh, um, perfect music here. The winged courser, like a generous horse, shows most true Middle, when you check his his course, like in a way, I, what I understand is that he, it's like, uh, if you if you control, if you try to control to limit this horse, this steed, it gives you better results. If you just keep it out in the open, doing whatever it wants to do, it won't help. And he's referring to the muse here. Our everybody, like those people who poets who can write, following the muse unrestrained, probably they're not going to, to be writing good poetry. You need to control and limit and organize and structure these things. So the winged courser, the horse, like a generous horse, probably the winged courser, maybe the muse itself, shows most middle. When does it show results, good results? When you check his course, when you control his, his how, where he's going, where it is going, where and how, when you follow the rules. And then the, the, the most interesting part, I quoted this before in one of the classes. The, the summary is, this, look at this. This is like an essay, like an academic essay with an argument, with the opening line, first follow nature being, you know, the general statement, and then narrow it down to things, and then going for the wrapping up. Those rules of old discovered, not devised. These rules have been discovered from ancient times. No man, no man made them up. They are not man-made. They are man-made. But the claim is that these men who put them down, wrote them down, were more into Di discovering them because they already existed in nature and because they already existed in the poetry of the great poets of the past. Those rules of all discovered, not devised, are nature still. They are nature still, but nature methodized. And look at, like, there's something different here. Remember, we, we, the, in the opening, he invited us to follow nature because nature is unchanging, unerring, nature is unchanged, nature is divinely bright, nature is the same, nature is fair. But the idea, I, what I understand here is that, what he implies is that, of course, nature has 
been changed because of society, because of civilization, because of man, because of industry, because of everything. So what he's doing, he claims to be methodizing nature. And I love how he's using this word as, as a verb. I'm not sure if it was used as a verb before. So not devised, but nature methodized. I am not making these rules up. I am just trying to regulate what has already been discovered in, in the past. Nature like liberty. Look at this simplistic, cool simile here. Like freedom, nature is but restrained. There's no absolute freedom. And nature itself is not absolute. Not because there's something wrong with nature, but perhaps because man changed nature. We don't want to follow the changed nature of things and people and life. We need to follow the origin, virgin uh, form of it. By the same laws which first herself ordained. Nature itself, I like the use of herself ordained. These are rules dictated upon us by nature. Not the trees necessarily, but the nature of things, nature of, of people. To many this is very extreme, very restrictive, very repressive, very suppressive even. But for Jonan, again, if you read this poetry, some of the most beautiful poetry was written in this period. It's similar to the Arabic poetry of, you know, the classical Arabic poetry where you have to do the same thing, the same rhyme scheme, the same, the same meter, choosing, you know, highly embellished language and choosing very uh, significant uh, subject matters to write about. Before I uh, let you ask questions, if you notice, I'm not sure uh, uh, whether, how much he, he, he sticks here to the same number of syllables and and feet, if you have time, extra time at home, some time to kill, could you please count the syllables and see whether he, you know, goes uh, for uh, perfect iambic pentameters or like at least the number of syllables and the number of feet. You'll be surprised that almost always he does that. But the other interesting thing is the couplets, the rhyme scheme. Frame, same, bright, light, impart, art, Provides, presides, soul, whole, sustains, remains, profuse, use, strife, wife. wife, steed, speed, horse, course, devised, methodized, restrained, and ordained. Not even one imperfect rhyme. If this is John Dunn, he could have thrown two or three imperfect rhymes in our faces. And that's why we'll see next class, well, again I said this many times, we'll see this when we talk about romanticism. Romanticism took all these things and you just literally trashed them. They are all all of them. That's, that's very, you know, extreme discipline here. But look at John Dunn, remember John Dunn, sometimes he goes for 12, sometimes he goes for, for 9. If you want to say something before the question, please. Okay. Okay. I think that he tries to make a connection between the note that he that he wrote at the beginning and the whole nature of nature itself. Like he's saying that if you find any anything that is more correct or anything more perfect than nature, you, uh, than this poetry, come back to me. And the same thing he says about nature. Nature is perfect, and you cannot find anything else that you can get inspired inspiration from. And but again, I take this as some kind of arrogant you know, uh, challenge. I take this as he say, you can't come up with better poetry than this. And this, with this mentality, with this mindset, with this world view, hopefully we will understand how uh, and why they uh, excluded John Donne and his followers from the English canon, how they trashed John Donne, how they negatively framed John Donne. And then we'll see how the Romantic said, okay, sorry. It's time for change now. Yep. Um, the opening of the Iliad also starts like this. Oh. Speak, oh, of the anger of Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this is again 
Look at it. If, you're not, if you don't read that, if you don't have knowledge, how can you make the connection? You have to be educated. You have to be a person who went to Oxford or Cambridge who studied the Iliad in order to understand to make this connection. They, they will find so many allusions, so many myths, so many inter, you know, so much intertextuality uh, with other texts that, it, that you have to be a, an educated person to, to realize this. And again, this in itself is challenging. This in itself pushes poetry up for the 1%, for the elite, so to speak, rather than for the masses. And this, again, thankfully will be challenged by the romantics uh, themselves. So we'll find the features of romanticism here, the subject matter, the language, the, the sophisticated language, the, uh, the rules of decorum, how strictly he uh, sticks to ten syllables, five feet, and the perfect couplets, uh, described sometimes as the, uh, the heroic couplet. This Alexander Pope is a, one of the most fascinating. Don't take me wrong. I'm not trashing anybody. I'm not saying this poetry is better than that poetry. I'm saying this uh, poetry is the poetry of its time, but later on we'll have people change this in many ways. It's up to you to like whichever uh, school or movement or poet, etc. You could, if you are interested, you could read uh, uh, or at least go to YouTube and listen to The Rape of the Lock, uh, a mock epic by Alexander, Alexander Pope. We have two questions here. How does the poem by Alexander Pope uh, reflect the rules of decorum that were followed in the neoclassical age in terms of form, theme, and, and language? And then number two, important question. He seemed, Pope seems to indicate that there is no room for originality and innovation. All you have to do is just to imitate, to follow. Follow. Don't invent. Don't, don't devise. Just follow the discovered rules in nature that nature itself or herself ordained. So I want you to think of this question. Why does Pope think there is no room? Because for many people, this is very, very serious. Like, it doesn't only reflect poetry, but reflects the mentality of the high class, the ruling class. If you belong to the ruling class, you, you need to believe this because you want people to follow you and your constructs and not to think about breaking the rules or breaking the pattern or changing the world view. And in this sense, I understand John Donne as a revolutionary poet, a man who uh, said no, who turned everything upside down. The same thing could apply to the Romantics, especially to William, uh, William Blake. Just if you give me one or two minutes maximum, again, I just want to remind you of something we went through before the rules of, of decorum by Horace. Uh, the Horace meant to guide the poets to the features how to write great uh, poetry. They were adopted from ancient Greece and Roman literature. The aim of poetry is to teach and delight, not to confuse, not to make us ask questions or raise questions or question things. In order to achieve greatness, themes uh, in poetry, themes, language, and forms have to be elevated. Like subject matters, things of great issues of great significance to the society as, as a whole, usually about universal truths to achieve decorum. Mixtures of forms should not happen. You shouldn't mix tragedy and comedy or different things. Uh, poetic diction, we spoke about the refined, highly embellished, sophisticated language. The language of, uh, of like, that's why you mix Latin. You use references to Sinai. Imagine someone in England, like 400 years ago, somebody telling him, Sinai, what's Sinai? I, I never heard of this word. Like, another reference is there. Uh, avoid conversational... Uh, colloquial language because this is the everyday language. You, you make poetry special. You don't just mirror what people say in the state. And finally, the form means that the rules of decorum dictate that the poem has to follow a regular form. We've seen this with uh, our friend Alexander Pope. In both the shape and the lines have to be well structured. This applies to the number of lines, the number of syllables, and even the rhyme scheme, which has to be regular. And again, I gave the, the sonnet as the example. Okay, uh, we'll stop here. If you have questions, uh, please stay. Article